go ahead. I'm Joyce, and I'm the fiance of Larry Claremont, and he started the Larry Claremont Museum. And I just want you to know the video you're about to see where we're dedicating this ties in with his childhood. He was born during the Depression. He didn't have much money, and believe me, he thought cars were wonderful. As young as six, seven years old, he admired and knew about the new cars. You'll see when you watch this video how Mr. Claremont always enjoyed cars. My name is Robert Olson. I'm the director of special events at Claremont Collections. Have a seat. As a director, I've watched Claremont over the past three years grow. So Larry and, uh, and Joyce, Joyce is the co-founder of the museum, they put together a uh, plan that they wanted to open to the public and share Larry's private collection. So Larry is a uh, successful businessman He's the president of Imperial Realty, and his business successes have afforded him the uh, ability to share all of this with us. So today at our dedication ceremony, we're gonna announce that uh, we've created a not-for-profit. So this, in the future, hopefully we'll uh, have perpetuity and continue on to form uh, partnerships and relationships with uh, educational groups, maybe some corporate groups, and uh, well, anyways, so Mr. Larry Claremont's a World War II veteran. He's 93 years young, car lover, great guy, fun to work with, but you never want to negotiate with him. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'm going to hand over the microphone to Larry and uh... Thank you, Mark. I just thought you all to know what a delight it is to have you here tonight to view my favorite thing, my classic car museum. I think that uh, probably it's one of the very few uh, classic car museums that have features other than cars. And I'll tell you why I'm saying this. When I decided to form this collection, there are car collections all over the world. 
and most of them have nothing but cars. I want to do something a little bit different, and other than cars, I wanted to set up outstanding events. I conferred with my board of directors, and they're here tonight. I have Gus from Meekum Auctions. I have my lovely uh, fiance and my significant other, Joyce Overlander. I have my son sitting at the table, Alfred Claremont. And I have, uh, let's see, my other son didn't make it tonight because he has some kind of a big business affair. I hope he makes money. <laughs> and we also have our courier, Ben Lockwood. Anyhow, what, uh, what I wanted to do, as I started to tell you, is to do something a little bit different, which we have accomplished. For example, I'll give you through a little tour. What, uh, what happened in Chicago before we had the freeways, and prior to World War II, we had Route 66. Route 66 went from Chicago to LA, and there's a famous song that everybody knows, and it's a famous song today. And uh, what I wanted to do was recreate that particular feature because it originated in Chicago. And what we have done is, on the way to Chicago and California, the very last gas station where you could buy fuel outside of Los Angeles was called the Cucamonga Gas Station. And it was revered even by Jack Benny on his radio show and his, and his Maxwell and, and his uh, sidekick and they would say, Maxwell, no, be sure. No, Rochester. Excuse me. <laughs> I'll tell you, I don't know what I would do without my significant other. All day long, let me tell you. <laughs> Anything else that I should say about it? <laughs> Anyhow, what we did is we recreated the Cucamonga gas station, and read all about it. We have some of the original gas pumps, two cents, three cents a gallon. And it took us almost two years to recreate that, that gas station. And now the one in California is a historic monument. Secondly, if you go by here, this little room right here, we have a model of the Titanic ship. As you all know, it was the largest, fastest ship to be built in the world and had a disastrous accident. 3,000 of the most prominent people in the world went down and died on the Titanic. We have uh, uh, very, very interesting historical facts other than the model. I, as, uh, as I have, and I bought it at a considerable price, the original menu of the first class passengers on posted in that room. So lots of historic things about the Titanic. To continue, what else have we got around here? We have Doug's restaurant, who is a famous hot dog, D-O-U-G restaurant. Thank you, Joyce, because I don't call it hot dogs, it's hot dog. And many of you remember this historic place, and people used to stand in line for an hour to two hours to go to this restaurant. And my curator, Ben Lockwood, was a, either a relative or a good friend of, of a friend of Doug, and uh, Ben went to him and he said, you know, we'd like to recreate your restaurant. And what a, what a great idea. He gave Ben everything that was in that restaurant, including the menus, the tables, the counters, and that's another item on display that you won't see anywhere else. We have a drive-in movie theater. We have the orig an original projector that you can see, and the little stands and the speakers at the old drive-in movie theaters. There aren't many of those left around the world, but there are a few. 
and you'll see a reproduction of one here at the Claremont Museum. Uh, if you continue to the very south, we have a clock of antique clocks and wristwatches. Who knows what is the largest collectible in the world? Raise your hand. Anybody know the largest collectibles in the world? Watches. What is it? Watches. Watch. Watches. Watches. No, you're wrong. <laughs> the largest collectible in the world, classic and antique automobiles. Classic and antique automobiles. Now, what does that mean? There are all kinds of collectors. Collectors of only specific makes, no other makes. There have collectors who have three or four cars, or four cars, or five cars. They don't show them, they pet them, they drive them, they work on them, and they're collectibles, but they're not showing in, in new museums. There are collectors all over the world, and in every single city of every major car, there is a car club consisting of members of that particular make of a car that they meet regularly and have shows and so forth. What else have we got? We have on the second floor, we have a model railroad. And this railroad is quite unique. You gotta get up and see it. We have uh, from, from Chicago to Los Angeles with all kinds of artifacts. It was kind of interesting the way I bought this car. Uh, we have a guest here tonight uh, from uh, another museum in Chicago. And uh, should I tell them the name of the museum? I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Murphy, where is he? Where's, 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 where's Murphy? The Dray House. See, see, yeah, Steve Murphy, the Dre House Museum in Chicago. They don't take many people in, but uh, we happen to be honored by uh, allowing us to visit the museum. And in the corner of the museum, he had a great big pile of boxes and crates. And I said to Mr. Murphy, what is that? He says, oh, that's a model, a model train railroad that we bought years ago, and we've never put it together. I said, well, that's very interesting because uh, what's one of the things that I wanted to do and put in my museum is have a model railroad. I said, what do you want for it? He says, I don't know, make us an offer. I said, well, it's your product. I don't want to insult you. I'll make you an offer. He says, make us an offer. I said, well, I'll give you $300 for it. I don't know what the hell I'm buying, but not only am I going to give you $300, but you've got to pack it up, put it in a truck, and bring it to my museum. It took, I think, two trailer loads. Anyhow, I've got it upstairs, and I call the curator of the Lionel Train Company in New York, and I said, you know, I got this box of Lionel trains, and we don't know how the hell it works or how the hell it puts together. I said, can you find me something, or, or one, of, one of your members in your organization, to put this thing together? He said, absolutely. And I said, I'll pay his fare, I'll pay his fare, I'll put him up in a hotel room, I'll pay his meals, I'll pay him a salary, anything you want. Well, one week goes by, two weeks, a month, two months, and Joyce and I go to Florida. We have a home in Fort Lauderdale. And we leave, and the box is in a corner, all in the condition as when I bought it, we didn't even know what the hell was in it. And we went to Florida, we came back six weeks later, and the first thing they told me is, Mr. Claremont, we have a surprise for you. Oh, I like surprises. <laughs> they take me upstairs on the second floor, and lo and behold, before my eyes, there is the Lionel train set put together, operating, and running by the, the effort of my staff, who were all Lionel train collectors when they were little. I want to give you a little history. 
because some of you may or may not remember some of the things I'm going to talk about. To begin with, when I was five years old, I lived in a little town called Maywood, Illinois, and the school that I was enrolled in was about seven blocks from where we lived. This was in the height of the Depression. We were on relief. My mother worked at the Paris store in Chicago to help support the family, and I lived there with my grandmother, who was very unique. We were on relief, and many times we had nothing in the house to eat but potatoes. And she was very creative with the potatoes. She'd cook them and fry them and bake them and roast them. And we had something to eat, nothing but potatoes sometimes for weeks on end. Now, I want to tell you the story because I'm in kindergarten, I'm in first grade actually, and I'm walking back from school to the house and I'm walking along, now back in mind, this was the era of Model T Fords. And the hood ornaments, on the hood ornaments on the Model T Fords were unscrewed and that's where you put the water in to lubricate the engines. And I'm walking along and I'm looking at these cars and I said, oh, these are really interesting. Some of them had thermometers on them, some of them had other features. And I walked over and I unscrewed one. I went over and I unscrewed another one. And I took them home and I put them on my dresser. <laughs> and every night and every morning I get up and I just admire those little hood ornaments. They were so nice. Two days later, I'm in the, in the front door and two policemen arrive. <laughs> and the policeman says to my grandmother, we would like to speak to Larry Claremont. I immediately ran and hid under the bed. My grandmother comes out and pulls me out from underneath the bed, and I straddle over to the police officers, and the two of them look at me and said to my grandmother, this is Larry Claremont, five years old? My grandmother said, yes. Oh, we were looking for somebody that stole all the hoods off the radiator caps off, and he says he's just a little boy. I said, well, I took him, and I'll bring him back if you want me to. <laughs> the police officer said, no, 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 don't bring him back, but don't take any more hood ornaments off of the covers. I said, you bet I won't. Anyhow, as, as time went by, I became very interested in cars. There were only really five major manufacturers in the United States, and there were not too many foreign imported cars. And I knew the style and the make of every single car that was ever made, and, and they were all different, all unique. They all had different features. Now, what I want to talk about is what has happened in the car industry in the last five years. As you know, the most popular cars today are SUVs. If you drive around today and you look at the cars, the bodies are almost identical. The only way you know who made the car is if you get to see the trunk lid and the manufacturer's name is on the car, you know who made it. I look around, I see all these cars, I don't know who the hell made them until I get up behind them and I can see the manufacturer. Now that's happened in the last five years. The other event that has happened in the last five years is the advent of elect all electric cars. And my prediction is that within the next five years, there will be no more cars fueled with petroleum. Everything will be electric. And it's being fostered in China, Almost every major manufacturer in the United States is now making electric cars. We just bought one made by Chevrolet called the, called the uh, BOLT, not the BOLT. Uh, it requires no gasoline and it goes for 250 miles on a charge. 
and the car was only $45,000, and I got a $7,000 tax credit. And I want to tell you, you can't beat it. The car is fantastic. It's serviced by any Chevrolet dealer. And what I am wondering, and I don't think anybody can answer this, is I have here, and many others have outstanding collections. And when the cars become all electric, what happens to the interest in these cars? I think they'll ever be more and more substantial and more interesting. I think that uh, I can tell you a couple of other quick stories without boring you too much. My significant other is tapping me already to shut up. <laughs> but I want to tell you a couple of stories about car collecting because most of you don't know this. During World War II, the war broke out in 1941. From 1941, most of you are too young to remember this, to 1946, there were no automobiles manufactured in the world. All the manufacturers were committed to making war materials. They made tanks, airplane parts, etc., etc. No cars made from 1941 to 46. And those who had the cars during that particular period, there was no rubber for tires. They had to make synthetic rubber. The Japanese had covered, uh, captured all the islands that had rubber trees. So to, uh, to, to go on and on, what happened is, and again, I want to emphasize this, at the end of 1946, we had in this country 18 million men in uniform. The Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, the Merchant Marine, et cetera, et cetera. Can you can imagine the war ended, there are 18 million men in uniform. Every one of them wants to come home, get their old job, and they wanted a car. Now, can you just imagine the car manufacturers at that time could only produce so many cars? A Plymouth, a Ford, a Chevrolet listed for six to seven hundred dollars. Six to seven hundred dollars to buy a new car. Eighteen million men coming out of the service and they all wanted cars, including me. So what happened was the new car dealers fell into a gold mine. And what happened is if you wanted a new car, they put you on a waiting list. The waiting list was anywhere from a year to three years before you were able to get a new car. But if you were smart enough to slip the dealer a little hundred dollar bill under the table, somehow your wait went from a year, two or three years to maybe two or three months. How about that? Slip the dealer a hundred dollars under the table. But what happened was several people were very disgruntled over having to pay money under the table and they didn't have the money to pay the money under the table and they were awake. And somehow the Internal Revenue Service decided that they would investigate the car dealers. Now most of you don't know this, and it was not even well publicized, but every single new car dealer in the United States was investigated by the Internal Revenue Service. About 30 of them got set in a slammer for 30 days. And all of them got fined. Every single new car dealer in the United States either went to prison or was fined. How about that? Anyhow, that's a, an item that uh, I just wanted to call to your attention. And the other thing is that uh, what we don't have today, which I find very interesting, and most of you won't remember, is that during the war, gasoline was rationed. 
as almost every other thing that you could purchase. Meat was rationed. Shoes, you couldn't buy shoes without a, without a coupon. Gasoline for your automobile was rationed with a coupon. And I have several collector cars in the museum here with the original sticker on them, and you could only buy five gallons at a time. So what, uh, what, what happens is that as time goes by, the, uh, the factor is when you pulled into a gas station, you got a lot of good service. You'd roll the window down, and the attendant would say, what, what, how much fuel do you want? And gasoline was five cents a gallon, or a dollar for five gallons. And you'd roll the window down and say, well, I'll take dollars worth. Yes, sir. The attendant then said, uh, would you like your windows washed? Oh, of course I would like my windows washed. Takes out a rag and he washes the windows. The next thing, he opens up the hood of your car. Now this is what every gas station in the United States serviced. The attendant would dip, put the dipstick in, check your oil for you. He'd open up the radiator cap to see if there was water in the car. You know? And he would nod and say, everything is all right, sir, or maybe you need a quart of oil or whatever. And he would tell the driver of the car. The last thing he did, he took a little, uh, a little meter and checked the air on your tires to see if all of our cars were properly inflated. Now, can you just imagine that today when you have to go to a gas station and you gotta pull out a car and push the car and hope that you push the right buttons to get the pump to open up to put fuel in your tank. I finally remember historically what great service that we had in those days. So that, uh, that pretty much covers some of the items that I wanted to talk about and talk about. And I hope I haven't bored you too much about it. But the whole thing is that the future of the car collecting industry is going to be continued. And I think that all the collectors who have old cars and cherish them will hold on to them and they'll be worth more and more in the future. Thank you very much for coming tonight. When a museum opens, it only gets about 7% of its revenue from the door. It's pretty shocking. But there is a path forward, and the path forward that many museums take, they form partnerships, they form bonds. Um, ourselves, we have a car here called the Golden Sahara II. That symbolically represents uh, maybe some things that happen in a museum. Uh, Keith Buckley, uh, if you want to say hi, Keith. He thinks it's a great partner to have at a car museum. And uh, to my right, uh, I'm sure everyone here in the room knows Gus, Gus from Eagle Watch, and I'm going to hand the microphone over and uh, he's going to talk about some really good educational items. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as Bob introduced me, I'm part of Meekum Auctions, and we that's how I started my relationship off with Larry in the museum. It was when I had that first opportunity several years back, I was in his museum amazed at what he had done back then, and I never met him. I actually had to go back in our database at our office and look him up and get his phone number to give him a call. And I made that call to him and he picked up very cordial as he usually does, but very brief. I only had about 30 seconds to get everything in I needed to say, and I was interested in speaking to him because when I walked through his museum, I saw this as an opportunity for the youth market to grow one day and seeing everything here to educate them. And he thought I was calling him to talk about cars. And I was actually talking about cars in the youth market. And I asked if I could meet with him and have an appointment and do lunch with him. And he said, sure, great, how's tomorrow? And I said, perfect. And I said, one o'clock? He goes, great. And I said, all right. He goes, he goes, do you have my address? I'm like, yeah, I'm looking at it. He goes, no, do you have my Florida address? I'm like, I don't, but give me that address. And uh, I got off the phone with him. I said, see you tomorrow. And I flew out to Florida to meet with him. And that's how we all started. 
And Joyce actually opened the door for me because he didn't mention Joyce at all at that point. And she goes, who are you? And I'm like, well, I got an appointment with Mr. Claremont at one o'clock and we're supposed to meet for lunch. She goes, let me check if he wants to see you. And uh, she put me in a holding pattern for a minute and came back and she says, okay. He said, fine, come on in. And that's when it all started. And I had approached him about talking about the youth market. And once again, we got off the subject and we focused on the cars that he had and what he wanted to potentially sell and buy and trade. But the, uh, the adventure from there began with, with the museum and me coming back. And as my inspiration came from the auction side to join with our youth market to keep this going, that's, that's something that we've taken seriously for the past several years as well because as we're all getting older, the interest in the cars change. And for us to keep this going and perpetuate not only the museum, but the whole market in the car industry, it starts with all our young groups and our young teenagers to get involved in all this. And then I, I happened to go to another car event uh, locally in Chicago at Collector's Car Garage that's local to us. And then I had the pleasure of meeting that gentleman, who's Bert Richmond, who's here tonight. And uh, we talked for a little while and I had picked up a, a flyer there engaging a youth market, which is the RPM Foundation that is run by Diane Fitzgerald. And she was actually having an event here at Larry Claremont's Museum that I engaged with. And we kind of all combined forces over the years and stayed close. And we do tours and things around the country with Diane and her organization. And there's about 60 students and professors here from local colleges and junior highs locally here. The vision here is to keep the museum of interest to all that youth market and grow even further. And to bring all that because of Larry and his family is really why we're here thanking him for that opportunity. And without that part of this in the Chicagoland market, it would be extremely hard to keep all the interest in the schools and the, to cater to their education in the future with all the cars that we have, and how has he described predicting electric cars. So it, it, that alone is, is, needs a, a welcome thank you to Larry Claremont and his family and Joyce and putting all this together. So we, we need to kind of acknowledge that. And with that said, the rest is just to enjoy ourselves tonight and kind of get used to this for the years to come of what we're gonna do with the youth market. So thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. So the room is great tonight. Anna Mercado is our event specialist. So the museum does have a, uh, an event space now that we are all enjoying. And this is something that uh, came about in our perpetuity plan. And upstairs, uh, up on stage also, uh, Ben Lockwood is responsible for putting a lot of our uh, uh, displays together and uh, paying attention to all the detail. So, Ben, you want to say something? Sure. Um, this has been a, a tremendous ride for me. When I uh, first uh, got involved with Larry back in uh, uh, like 2010, and uh, uh, you know, I joined a uh, realty company. Never in my wildest dreams being a car guy that I think I'd be involved in something like this. It's a dream uh, to be involved and, and to work with Larry all these years and to you know uh, help uh, facilitate uh, making this collection what it is today. And uh, uh, Larry has just done a phenomenal job uh, and put every everything he could into building this. He's here every day when he's up here uh, trying to make it uh, uh, even better. So. Uh, for everybody here, um, just enjoy uh, all the many things there are to see and uh, uh, to do in this uh, tremendous museum. Thank you. So there's going to be drinks and hors d'oeuvres, and there's more food. We're going to be in here until at least 10 o'clock tonight. So everyone uh, enjoy themselves, and uh, the museum's open for tours, and uh, let's have a good time. Thank you. Kind of need a, yeah, there you go.